you can then reconstruct. Everything is being recorded. Uh, <laughs> just been told it's being recorded. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, given enough um, properties of a, a, a spectral triple, um, you can reconstruct the, the the manifold from from that. Um, and various properties. Well, there are various sort of regularity properties. Um, there's also uh, a condition on the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator. That the nth eigenvalue is going something like n to the uh, one over d, which is characteristic of eigenvalues for a Dirac operator on a d manifold. Um, and there's also some sort of Hochschild Cauchy cycle condition. Can't spell. Hochschild cycle, in fact. That if you take um, a sum of algebra elements and commutators with the Dirac operator, um, like this, to uh, A, D, then that's um, kind of the volume form of the manifold, but in this um, Dirac, on this Dirac bundle, this gives you the, the chirality operator, can okay. That's some sort of nonlinear condition telling you that there's that there are essentially it tells you there are d independent coordinates uh, on your manifold. Um, so, so, so the the story is that given enough extra stuff, you can then recognize you can recognize a manifold entirely in terms of, of a spectral triple. Um, and, and of course, it, it's a difficult story as to what the hell a manifold actually is. <laughs> I mean, you can easily write down special examples of manifolds, but you know, to write down what a general manifold is, is a long, long story, whatever approach you take. <laughs> um, and it, so this is one of them. Okay. Right, so, um, so now let's talk about the non-commutative spectral triples and you know how that differs from this, this picture here. Um, so firstly, A is just a star algebra. And of course it can be non-commutative here. That's the point. Um, um, and H is a Hilbert space. And the crucial thing here is it's a bimodule over the algebra. So there's a left action and a right action. And as before, there's commuting action of uh, gamma R grading operator, which is uh, in the commutative case was this chirality. Um, and we call this the chirality operator in non commutative geometry as well. Um, the Dirac operator is again some map on the Hilbert space. Um, and again, it commutes or anti commutes with the chirality, depending on these odd or even cases of this parameter S. Um, and now the first order condition um, is generalized to this rather subtle uh, thing that you, what you do is you take the commutator of the Dirac with the left action of an algebra element, and then you take the commutator with some arbitrary right action of um, of the element of some other algebra element, and that's zero. And that's the sort of the non commutative extension of, of the first order condition. Um, perhaps I should go back a minute and say why, why is this the first order condition at all? So, so in the um, example of a manifold here, um, where D is a Dirac operator and A is a, is a function on the manifold, then the point is that the commutator of D with an algebra element is a zeroth order function. So D is a first order differential operator and the commutator with, with, a, with, a, with a function is a zeroth order operator. In other words, it just acts as endomorphisms on, on the spinner um, bundle at each point. And then if you commute again with another function, you get zero. That, so that's why the, um, I go back to the, the original commutative first order condition, that's why that tells you in the case of a manifold that it's a first order differential operator. It doesn't have any higher, higher um, order parts. 
So, um, so in the non-commutative world, the direct generalization, if I put both left actions in here, would make no sense. Because in actual fact, you can rapidly uh, convince yourself that that's sort of inconsistent because you can sort of rearrange it and then you find that, that uh, too many things have to commute with too many other things, but it's non-commutative and that doesn't make any sense. Um, so this rather subtle um, rearrangement of the first order condition is the right one uh, for non-commutative geometry. Okay, um, so now I want to talk about an extra structure which in practice uh, comes into all the examples that, that we know and love, and that's called a real structure. Um, and in essence, it's the difference between between you know sort of the real and the complex case, um, particularly of Clifford modules. Um, so um, in actual fact, in the manifold case here, it's what guarantees that you have a spin manifold, not just a spin C manifold. So anyway, let's describe it. It's an anti-linear map on the Hilbert space. It squares to either plus or minus one. So there's two different cases there. Um, and it either commutes or anti-commutes to the Dirac operator. So again, two more different cases. Um, and it commutes or anti-commutes of the chirality operator. Uh, so it turns out that those signs um, uh, actually determine a parameter uh, which has eight different values. So there's a question there. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, is it true that you already need this real structure uh, in order to have a right action? Well, you can either, huh, it, so you can either say that it's a bimodule and therefore you have a right action, or you can define it using this real structure. So, you, you, you know, you can do it either way. So I've, I've said, you know, there is a, um, uh, I've put the bimodule first, but then you're, you're just anticipating this condition here that uh, in the non-commutative case, uh, what we say is that the right action here, so this is A acting to the right, so that's that, that mm -hmm. notation, is determined by the left action. So it's given by A star acting on the left, but then you, you conjugate with J here. So if you know the left action and you know J, then, you, then this determines the right action. Um, yes, but what I so meant that in, in, in usually in examples, this uh, this is exactly how this right action is obtained using the left action and J. And without J, okay, you can postulate it uh, as an axiom, but uh, is it natural to, to demand this, to require that you have a bimodule not having J? I think you can, you can um, think of that as um, the analog of a spin C structure in the non-commutative case. So, and then the existence of the J, which intertwines the left and the right actions is the thing that is the non-commutative analog of a spin structure. So that's, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's just sort of a, a different way of reordering the axioms. It doesn't, doesn't end up with anything any different. Mm -hmm. So in the commutative okay. case, um, you have a rather simpler um, axiom with the, the real structure. It's just that it, um, if you conjugate with the real structure, it turns A star into A. Um, and obviously this thing uh, doesn't generalize to the non-commutative case because, um, because this, uh, this left-hand side here is the same as this thing here with this left action here. And this would tell me that the left action is equal to the right action. But in a bimodule, left actions and right actions commute, and therefore you have the proof that the algebra is commutative. So this this uh, axiom for the commutative case again has a non-trivial generalization here. So this is, a, if you like, non-trivial uh, generalization. Okay, um, turns out to be fruitful. Yeah, so, um, so now I want to, uh, to go straight to <laughs> explaining the example of the internal space of the standard model. So this might seem a very esoteric example, um, but not so in the sense this was um, Alan Kahn's main motivation for uh, constructing this theory of uh, real spectral triples. Um, 
he did it to accommodate the example given by the internal space of the standard model. Um, and in actual fact, the, the axioms for uh, the spectral triples were somewhat fluid. And if you go back far enough in the literature, the axioms are slightly different. Um, and um, so, for example, there was some axioms called Poincaré duality, which came in, in some early work. And, and that was motivated by the example of a commutative case of, of a manifold. Um, but when this was applied to the non-commutative, um, you know, the particle physics, uh, it was discovered that axiom didn't hold. <laughs> and so that was thrown out. And so very much the axioms were molded so that this example, and a few other critical examples like the non-commutative torus, uh, were examples of non-commutative geometry. Um, okay, so so historically this, is, this plays a very important role. And, and it's quite an important role in my story because I want to explain why what we're doing is motivated by physics and you can't get more, more physics than this. So here we are, let's go. Um, so we have um, uh, the spectral triple AHD and I've put a sub F on them. Um, and it's a finite real spectral triple. And what that means, it, it, uh, the finite means that uh, the algebra A and the Hilbert space H are finite dimensional. So it's very much a matrix construction here, different in flavor from the, the previous manifold construction. So the parameter S here, um, which I mentioned briefly is, is six. Um, of course, I didn't really explicitly construct the parameters here, but what that means is, is that there are very specific signs here. So J squared is plus one, this is plus, and this one is also plus, in fact, in this case. Um, so, whoa, no, uh, this one is minus, that's right. So the case of all pluses is, is, is S is zero, not eight. Yeah, anyway, so, um, so S is six here, so that's particular signs. Um, and the algebra is, what is it? It's, well, it's a real algebra for a start, and it's three by three complex matrices thought of as a real algebra. Um, direct sum with quaternions, which is a real four-dimensional real algebra, direct sum with the complexes uh, as a two-dimensional real algebra. Um, so the Hilbert space is C96 <laughs> and Y96. Well, it's, it's the Hilbert space which um, has a basis labeled by all the names of all the elementary fermions in the, in the standard model. So, so here they are, I've named them. So L sub L is the left-handed leptons and there's, there's two of those, an electron and a neutrino. ER is a right-handed um, uh, electron, so that's one. Nu R, right-handed neutrino. Quark left, there's six of those, three. Um, there's up and down, and there's three colors. And then the down right and the up right is three each. And that adds up to 16. Um, and then we multiply by three because there's three generations. So they all get repeated three times in the standard model. So we get to 48. Um, and then we have, um, if you like, independent basis elements that all are complex conjugates, or if you like, they're sort of uh, conjugate fields, um, or in physics speak, antiparticles. So there's another 48. So that adds up to your, your 96. That's where the 96 comes from. OK. Um, and. Written over here on the right is a table which tells you what the action of this algebra is on, on this C96. And basically you read MQ lambda, that's a matrix, a quaternion and a complex number. And here's the left and in fact the right actions uh, on these particles. So the left, so on this two dimensional space here of left leptons, you act with the quaternion on the left or the complex number lambda on the right. Um, or the um, left-handed quarks here, you act with the quaternion on the left or the three by three matrix transposed on the right and, and so on. And that tells you all of the, all of the action as a bimodule. So um, uh, the action of J is simple. It just turns the basis vector here into its, its barred version and back again. And the Dirac operator, when you apply all the axioms, you discover various things uh, in it. Well, certainly some things have to be zero because of the anti-commuting with the chirality operator. 
he actually discovered from the first order condition that this is this is equal to zero, um, and you discover that m uh, is not equal to zero. And what what m is, point to it here. Uh, m contains uh, the Higgs vacuum expectation value. What it contains, in fact, and the um, the mass matrices for the for the, the Dirac mass matrices, if you know what that means. Um, and the H uh, here contains the Majorana mass matrices or the neutrino. So that's sort of, they're matrices full of constants, which you have to pick out of the experiment in your, in your physics. Um, and it's quite remarkable, all this data fits in naturally uh, and all the things you don't want don't fit in <laughs> and the axioms tell you that they're zero. So um, so this is sort of astonishing in a way that all this stuff that comes out of physics, particle experiments and so on, all fits in this, this very tight mathematical framework. Um, and astonishing it is because there are plenty of other, you could easily vary physics in, in you know, the physicists can write down lots of different ways of doing their particle physics that, you know, that aren't realized in nature, but they could do it slightly differently. And almost all of the, the changes you might make don't fit in, in this scheme. So so, uh, so the, the real world has a non-commutative geometry structure and lots of imaginary worlds don't, in fact, billions of imaginary worlds don't. So this is something, something remarkable about this, this whole construction. Sorry, may I sure. ask a question? Yeah, sure. So this uh, uh, this matrix uh, uh, has some units, yes? Units of mass, yes? Is it true? Yeah. If you like, so yeah. What what happens if you if you change the unit? So since this is not the dimensionless, yes. So yeah. it somehow depends from the choice of of your unit of mass, yes. In a way. Yeah. So is it a problem or is it is it okay? No, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, so you'll see in a minute, you see, I haven't constructed the whole standard model, which I'll do in the next slide briefly, but once you put it all together, then everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so now we go to the describing the vacuum of the standard model. So uh, this spectral triple A H D is space time. So is the the manifold as before the you know, this, the um, space time as a as a commutative um, uh, spin manifold. Uh, the only difference here is it's not compact. But let's ignore that and <laughs> assume we lived in a compact space time. Um, the um, so what you do is you take a product of the um, space time manifold and the internal space so it's very much geometrically like taking a product where you have you have you know one space time say this way horizontal direction and the internal space vertically um so it's just like you know a cartesian product but expressed in this algebraic formalism so you tensor together the algebras you tensor together the hilbert spaces and then the dirac operator uh, which i'm calling d naught has the um, the manifold piece and you add the um the, the piece in the finite direction. Um, and in fact, tensor with the chirality operator on the manifold to make the whole thing, make sure the two different parts anti commute with each other. Um, so, so such a D naught is called the vacuum of uh, the standard model for the space time. Um, and it's somewhat mysterious because um, just going back a minute, the um, it contains this DF here and the DF contains lots of magic uh, matrices with constants in them, which you've, you've got out of your hard one experiments with your billions of dollars. Um, so, um, so there's a big mystery as to what the hell those numbers are and wh why they take those values and not some other values. I mean, so this, do this doesn't explain that. It, it just provides a home to put them, <laughs> but doesn't sort of explain what that is. So, um, <clears throat> Okay, and the, the physical fermion fields are in fact in H plus. They're, they're a subspace of this tensor product here. Um, 
given by the overall chirality being equal to one. In other words, if I tensor the manifold chirality and I tensor the, the finite space chirality, which I actually showed on here, which is on this thing, but it's the obvious thing. You, you just say a left-handed particle has is one and the right-handed particle is minus one. In fact, the opposite for the antiparticles. Um, so um, what this does is it, 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 it syncs up the internal space chiralities and the manifold um, spinner chiralities in a nice way. So everything works out right. Um, and then finally, you can get all the bosonic fields in nature into one Dirac operator. <laughs> you take this D naught, this vacuum, and you add what are called the internal fluctuations here. Uh, so you take any algebra elements, A, I, and B, I, and you essentially, this is a one, you think of this as one form, so this is A times D, B um, in the commutative world, that's what it would be. So you're adding to a Dirac operator some arbitrary one form which acts on the, on the bundle, and that's that's how you add a gauge field normally to a Dirac operator. So this is sort of just the non-commutative analog of, and when you unpack it all and, and, and split it into its individual components, this is exactly what it is. In fact, it's a gauge field and the Higgs field all wrapped up together. Um, and of course, our D naught has the, the space-time metric in it. So all the bosonic fields of nature, including gravity, are all sitting there in this Dirac operator. So uh, remarkable construction. Okay, so that's explained, I hope, the, the formalism and explained what a classical geometry is. Um, it's not only the Riemannian geometry of a manifold, but it also extends to include uh, various physics fields in a very nice way, as long as you're happy to accept the idea of a non-commutative internal space in this product. So what do I want to do? Well, um, my really i'm interested in quantum uh, um, field theory and quantum models um so i want to construct a partition function in which um so there's some sort of integral over um some exponential factors here um and i integrate over all the the dirac operators which i should translate that means you're integrating over all the data that goes into the dirac operator in other words all the bosonic fields in nature. And I'm also integrating over all the fermionic fields in nature. That's what this deep psi is. And of course, this is this is called Grassmann integration. This is this is a fermionic integration. Or Berezin integration, it's sometimes called. So it's the right thing when you learn quantum field theory. Um, and the thing you're integrating here is the exponential of minus an action. So this is very much a Euclidean, um, this is Euclidean physics. And I'm assuming here that Euclidean world translates into the Lorentzian world, but that's another whole issue. Um, so that's what you do in, in uh, Euclidean physics. You have e to the minus some action here, um, S. And the fermionic thing is still um, as a phase, there's I times this, there's a standard Euclidean uh, Dirac action, which is to take the real structure on psi um, and inner product it with deep psi. And the inner product is the you know the L2 integration over the whole manifold. It's the it's the um, it's the inner product in our in our Hilbert space um, that we're using for in the spectral triple. Okay, um, so this I've handwritten, so you don't think it's a very precise formula because it isn't. <laughs> Uh, it you know, has all the usual problems of quantum field theory in, in physics that we sort of know how to do some things with it, but other things are a bit of a mystery, particularly what the precise definition is mathematically is something of a mystery. Um, but at least it gives us a new way of phrasing this, this whole um, uh, problem um, into this non-commutative geometry framework of, of spectral triples. Um, so I'm interested in that translation and then how, what we can do to, to solve models like this and, and uh, eventually one day, what will that tell us about physics? So anyway, so I started to list various issues about this, this uh, formalism here. Uh, firstly, what is G here? 
because I said, you know, I want to integrate over the Dirac operators, but there's something, you know, very, very sort of odd about what I said about what the Dirac operators are. So firstly, D naught, or D naught was, our, uh, sorry, uh, D naught, yeah, D naught was obtained from the space-time manifold, which uh, was this commutative thing. And there were all sorts of extra special conditions to make sure we had a, we had a, a manifold, you know, this Hoch shield thing, various regularity and so on. So it's all, it's all very technical and quite special. Um, and then the other mystery is in this finite thing here. Well, it's got all these constants that we don't know where they come from. Um, and then I, so, you know, who ordered D naught? You know, where does it come from? And, um, and then I've got to do these internal fluctuations to generate other fields. So that's nice, but it all depends on this choice of D naught here. Um, and why these internal fluctuations? Why am I not allowed to take any Dirac's that satisfy the axioms? I mean, if I said that, then it would all be simple. I wouldn't even have to worry about what D naught was. It would just be a, a average, you know, an average point in the in the space of all Ds. Um, so, so this this construction of of what the the um, the space of Dirac's is is a, is, a, is a very tricky and and it's very odd construction from the point of view of non commutative geometry. You seem to do different things with the commutative uh, direction with space time and and the the non commutative internal space direction you seem to have different sort of uh, formalisms for saying what the Dirac operators are okay uh, so is df fixed uh, or could we perhaps in our formalism allow the all those constants to vary and and perhaps have something that that you know uh, in cosmology would would um, you know perhaps in different parts of the universe they, they can have different values or something depending on on you know other you know what the metric is or something um what's the action here s uh, that's um there's you know so there's a well-known action action called the con champs spectral action um and there's two parts to it i mean alan con had a very great a great idea that the action should be spectral in other words it only depends on the the eigenvalues of the dirac operator um and fantastically um if you write the standard model um, uh, uh, action it, in the usual physics sense, it does indeed only depend on the on the uh, eigenvalues of the Dirac operator, and that's a that's a fantastic all, all the bosonic action in a physics textbook. Only depends on the eigen and that, so that's a complete fantastic fact, which you know you prove by expanding it with heat kernel coefficients and then identifying all the heat kernel coefficients as as all the the actions in the physics textbook. So why on earth that should be true is, is a fantastic mystery because you could write down loads of other things that aren't that aren't spectral, um, but they don't seem to occur in physics. So so there's you know so that's a fantastic idea that this is the spectral action. But what it is apart from that is a mystery. I mean Kahn and Shamsuddin proposed a formula which works very well for the particle physics side, but it doesn't seem to work very well for the gravity side. Um, and um, uh, so, so there's a you know it's an open question as to how one one could improve that formula. Um, so another question: Are any axioms just equations of motion? So one thing that often happens in in quantum theory is you, um, I mean, you know classically what your classical configurations are or something, but you find that some of the properties of those classical configurations are really just because they're stationary points of some quantum action. So some of the properties may just be, you know, uh, the stationary equations that you get by looking at stationary points of some quantum action. And they may not be fundamental as axioms at all. Um, so we can't take for granted that that, that the axioms are, uh, you know, are uh, the same as the, the ones for a classical geometry. Uh, and finally, what the hell is functional integration? I've, I said, you know, these will be um, as I've written so far, these will be infinite dimensional spaces here, and I'm now supposed to integrate over them. And you have all the same, all the usual problems that you have in physics of saying what quantum field theory is boils down to what, what do you mean by functional integration? Okay, so those are all the issues. <laughs> and there's probably more if you, if I had longer, I could go into more and you could probably think of some more yourself. Um, so, um, so that's the end of the motivation section. I, I want some formalism which will a be more precise and make mathematical sense, and b 
eventually shed some light on some of these mysteries here by saying, well, uh, this formula I've written down in handwriting is some imprecise version of the more precise formulas that we can make mathematical sense of. That's, that's the project, if you like. Okay, so we come on to, to random uh, Dirac models. Um, and I uh, hope I haven't lost you all. Um, so now I get back onto solid ground again a bit with things that make mathematical sense. Um, I'm going to assume the fermions are integrated out already. So if you, so if you go back to this formula here, um, and if my function only depends on D and not on the fermion fields, I can integrate out this thing here. You just get some sort of determinant. So it's some function of the, the bosonic field. So I can just so absorb that into the, the, the S here. Um, so I, I'm assuming I've done that. So goodbye fermions, um, at least goodbye integration over fermions. The fermions are still there in the Hilbert space, of course. Um, in the formalism, I'm gonna fix the Hilbert space and the algebra to be finite dimensional. So that's a huge, huge simplification and a huge, you know, <laughs> means suddenly everything's well defined and you're talking about matrices. Um, but I want it to be non-commutative. And what that means particularly is my replacement for the uh, space-time manifold is now non-commutative space. So we've got to learn uh, how to work with uh, non-commutative, uh, finite non-commutative uh, spectral triples as proxies for uh, space-time. Uh, as proxies for commutative and infinite dimensional things that, that traditionally describe space time. Um, now, I claim this is an advantage because um, there's in any way a problem at the Planck scale as to what on earth happens at very short distances. So are, are there really infinitely many degrees of freedom anyway in a, in, in a physics on a manifold? Um, and I would argue not. So, um, so in any way, there's, so there's good reasons for wanting to do this. Um, except we will want to do use very large <laughs> finite dimensional constructions. But anyway, it's finite dimensional and non-commutative. Um, and I'm going to simplify the space G of geometries by saying it's all Dirac operators satisfying the, the axioms of the real spectral triple. So that does mean we don't focus in on a particular dimension D and we don't have the Hochschild condition that Alan Kahn has. Um, so our models will probably contain different things of different dimensions all, all in the same model um, so there's no guarantee that that you'll you'll be homing in on a particular particular dimension um, the um, action is trace of some function of d um, and that of course guarantees that it's spectral so it's it's invariant under it only depends on the spectrum of d um, and this should be bounded below so that my my integration of e to the minus sd is going to converge uh, as long as um, s is, uh, behaves well uh, when d is a, a very large, then this will be a convergent integral. So hooray, I've uh, got ordinary integration on my vector space um, of a convergent integral here. Um, and um, so, so this is a very simple formalism. It's uh, ordinary integration, ordinary uh, you know, Lebesgue integration on, on uh, finite dimensional vector space. Um, and there are various ways you could tweak this. You could perhaps put in some constraints, uh, which if you wanted to go back and put in Kahn's Hochschild condition, be some sort of nonlinear constraint, and then you'd have some more complicated integration. But perhaps uh, it would be compact rather than non-compact. Who knows? Anyway, so that's the way I'm, I'm doing this in this simple way um, on this vector space. Um, and here is a, uh, here's a large class of examples, which I'm going to use to construct the particular random Dirac models we're interested in. Um, so MN here stands for the N by N matrices. Uh, and V is a module for the Clifford algebra, the, the PQ Clifford algebra. So just to explain here that when you have a, uh, a Clifford algebra, you can write this as uh, generated by gamma matrices. So I have some of the gamma matrices. Uh, their squares are, um, you know, the generators square to plus, they square to plus or minus one. Um, and we have uh, P of them. Um, so the number of uh, 
of the things that square to plus one is p and the number of things that square to minus one is is q that's what i mean by the pq clifford module okay um and my parameter s which um i talked about earlier for spectral triple turns out to be q minus p mod eight so it's sort of the if you like the signature of the of the clifford module in this example which is why i got called s in the first place um so the algebra is uh, is just the n by n matrices over c or possibly real versions um the Hilbert space, you take um, this algebra as a vector space and you tensor it with the, with the Clifford module. So if you like, it's um, a number of copies of uh, MNC um, with the number of copies being the dimension of, of V, dimension of the spin. So, so it's like, you know, you think of this, if you think of MNC as sort of as a vector space as, as the functions on your, your non-commuting manifold, uh, then V is the is the spinner space at each point, and so the the the, uh, the space of of um, spinner fields on your this manifold is is uh, is dimension V times bigger um, because of, of of all the different uh, spinner components you have at each point. Uh, not that you have points in the non commuter manifold. <laughs> okay, um, and the inner product is the product thing. Um, the um, the left action, the thing I called uh, a uh, left action like this, is is row in this in this notation here, and you simply multiply matrices. You ignore the spinner part, and the chirality operator, big gamma here, is is the normal spinner chirality on the spinner part, and you ignore the matrix part, which is why it gets to commute with with the left action. And the J, the real structure here, um, uh, is the charge conjugation operator on the spinners, and it's just the normal emission conjugate on the matrices. So you can prove easily that if you if you commute with J, this uh, this left action here, it becomes the right action, which is what our friend here who asked the question uh, liked to have it presented that way around. That if you if you're given the left action the J, you can then work out what the right action is, and it's just the multiplication of matrices on the right. Okay, and the Dirac operator, well, it's just all the things that satisfy the axioms, and there's a job of work to work out what they are, and they're very simple things. You can write explicitly uh, in, in, uh, in examples, depending on the type here of the size of the Clifford module. As that gets bigger, you have more and more terms in your Dirac operator. But anyway, so here we are, type 0, 0, there's no Dirac operator. <laughs> type 1, 0, um, there's one gamma matrix, and you can have uh, an anti-commutator, that's what the curly brackets are with the Hilbert space, with so with with, an, uh, with the matrix H, um, so H is a matrix, so H and L are the matrices, matrices. So you can have the anti-commutator that, so the anti-commutator dot means when well, you're putting in the, um, you're putting in the, um, elements of the Hilbert space into this thing here. So um, anti-commutator means the left action minus the right action, uh, according to, to this thing here. So multiplying on the left on the matrix part and multiplying on the right minus multiplying on the, uh, sorry, yeah, with the, uh, the anti-commutator plus multiplying on the right and the commutator with the square brackets minus. Okay, and so various cases here, depending on the on the signature of your Clifford module, you have you have various commutators and anti-commutators tensored with gamma matrices. So it's much like you would expect uh, to write a formula in the commutative world. If you think of the, in fact, if you think of the um, the commutators as like derivatives, this is this would be gammas times derivative operators, and then here this would be gamma times multiplication of functions. Here is the sort of commutative analog of the anti-commutator. So various um, Dirac operators with various, um, well, thinking in the analog commutatively, various zero, zero for first order parts in them. Okay, so that's a, a fuzzy space. So what we want to do is have a random fuzzy space. So what this means is that random just means that this these matrices. Uh, H and L are free data. 
uh, and the various indices. So, so the, there might be several matrices of the same type, H1 and H2 and so on. But essentially your integration is just integrating over these spaces of matrices. So it's a matrix model. Okay, so that's, uh, that's where we come in with studying matrix models. Um, and the very simple cases are one matrix matrix models and the more complicated cases have you have two and, and as we'll see in higher dimensions they have more more matrices. Okay, so um, so when uh, um, Al Glaser and I first uh, started out on this, we uh, looked at some simple examples and um, so uh, and we discovered that if you take um, a, um, a potential here which has a d fourth and a negative d squared terms so this parameter g2 is negative um, you get a phase transition as you vary g2 so this is what the potential looks like sort of a mexican hat higgs type potential um, and it gets bigger here with more negative g2 and here's the distribution of eigenvalues in our monte carlo um, it starts off for low values of um, it's the same colors as here uh, so low values of g2 um, uh, sort of broadly flat or so sort of one dimensional and at the phase transition here um, this curve is a very I love this curve it's very nice it's it's typically what you'd see of a typically low dimensional Dirac operator on a manifold um, and as you go away from the phase transition these become flatter here so they're like like the eigenvalue distributions of a very high dimensional thing so this is a phase transition from one dimensional spaces to uh, very high dimensional spaces through critically at critical points some nice, nice uh, low dimensional space there. Um, so that's what we discovered. Uh, and finally, if I've got time, um, I'm going to want to mention some of the work done by my student, uh, Mara D'Arcangelo, who was um, given his, uh, had his PhD exam last week. Um, so, so all the rest of the details are from his thesis here. So he studied some higher types, um, and I'm going to focus his, in on his results for type 3, 0 and 0, 3. And his thesis has got plenty of other types in it, so it's a very good read. Um, and here are the Dirac's for these. They, they've got, there are four pieces. So for 3, 0, you have one commutator with some matrix M0 and three anti-commutators here. And the sigma i's here are, are the 2 by 2 Pauli matrices. Um, whereas the type 0, 3 is sort of the other way around, that this um, constant term here is an anti-commutator term, and there's three derivative-like terms here, which are commutators with matrices at. And it makes sense to decompose the matrices into T, the trace part, and V, uh, the, the traceless part here. So I'll make use of that in, in what follows. Okay, so uh, this is what you get for uh, doing Monte Carlo simulations of, of the type 3, 0. Um, and I've, I've repeated the Dirac here for, for your benefit here. Um, and uh, and this here, this is what happens when you vary the G2. So this is where you go through the phase transition um, like we had in, in our earlier paper. And, and this one shows a very, very sharp phase transition uh, here. In, in the order parameter here is the sum of the t's, so it's t1 squared plus t2 squared plus t3 squared. So that's the trace part of these matrices here. Um, and at this negative value of g2, it suddenly takes off and goes up in this curve here, which we can explain in a minute. Um, and um, the the other parts of the matrices don't do anything spectacular. You can see there's a phase transition here, but but it qualitatively it doesn't. Well, there's a nice um, curve here. Uh, on, on these other things, but they don't do anything spectacular after the phase transition for more negative values of G2. And you can see here uh, what happens to rho squared. So that's this first one, the sum of the Ts, the order parameter here. Um, before the phase transition, they're very much clustered near zero. And then you have a smooth flat distribution and then they do a the non-zero expectation value after, afterwards. Uh, so it's a second order phase transition, or very much looks like it, to a commutative phase. And if you plot the values of these t's here, uh, he's done this in this Monte Carlo. You can see very nicely they're they're 
filling out points on this sphere. So, so it's really a commutative sphere you're looking at as the configuration space. Um, <clears throat> so here's, uh, more excitingly, here's the type 03 case. Um, so this is the Dirac here. And this one's got three commutators in it. And something more exciting happens. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the vacuum here, you can um, understand by what's known as the fuzzy sphere. So my V matrices here, they're the ones that, that well, there's no obvious phase transition. There's definitely at this place here that we had before. Something funny happens at a higher value of negative G2, but we don't actually quite understand whether this is numerical artifact or not. Um, so uh, probably not actually, because anyway, yeah. Um, but anyway, so this rises on this curve here and, um, and um, yeah, so that's the important thing to understand. This this some of the traces of the, these are the V's are the are the the non-trivial parts of these matrices here, um, and you can model them by looking at the sphere. So you take if you take um, angular momentum generators or SU two generators of the Lie algebra, the commutator, the Hermitian things um, that look like this, and if I take an irreducible representation. Um, and do a calculation, then you can work out what you expect in that classical geometry, this sum of this trace of V squared to be. And it um, is this is the exact formula that you expect when you, what you so what we're doing is we take our um, action, we solve for the critical points of the action, that's where the classical geometries are, and then we um, understand what this, uh, for those solutions here that look like this, what this this order parameter should be. And this is a precise formula you get. Um, and that's what's worked out here in uh, for this particular case of, uh, let me see, it's 10 by 10 matrices and these values of very negative values of G2. So it's way off to the left of this, this graph here. Um, and so the, the this formula here uh, is, is given here, and this is what you get in the Monte Carlo. So it, it's extraordinarily close. Um, and it's not this minus G2 over 16, which actually you get from a commutative model here. Um, so, so there's evidence that this, uh, this is non-commutative here. And you can also plot the eigenvalues densities of these matrices, um, these matrices, um, the, the three V matrices. And you see they look just like the eigenvalue densities of, of the generators of, of SU2. You should expect them to be evenly spaced at integer points. And so what's plotted here is, is um, V1, the first matrix, and in down here in the different color here, sort of bluish color, is the commutator of V1 and V2. So that's still looking like an angular momentum generator. Um, so, um, and in fact, the area under each curve is, is approximately the same. So it looks very good that this is a, a, a fuzzy sphere is the vacuum. So there's a, a non-commutative vacuum uh, for this model here. Now, here's the very interesting thing. Um, at low values of the coupling constant down here, um, the two models are the same. So if you just remember these, what these three curves look like, and I flip back to the, to the previous slide, um, on this part of the diagram, apart from the scaling of the axis, it's exactly the same behavior. And it turns out that's not surprising because uh, the models are essentially the same at, at low values of G2. Um, you can see it sort of analytically. Um, so what we're saying here is that uh, at high uh, values of, of minus G2, we can substantiate the fact that it, the vacuum is non-commutative and is this fuzzy sphere. And it appears to be the same because nothing happens very much around here all the way down to where it agrees with the other model. So it suggests, uh, a very, very great um, suggestion, is that this model here, this type 3 zero, has, is non-commutative here, has a phase transition to a commutative phase over here. Okay, so um, so I see Uri is, is in on the call, so he knows as much about this as, as me. <laughs> um, and um, so I, I'm going to end there, and uh, I guess I've probably run out of my time. Um, I've just got some conclusion here. Um, we'd like to model Euclidean uh, quantum space times, so uh, 
quantum space times with the Euclidean signature. Um, and we're modeling them with a random Dirac model. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at very much looking at toy models and trying to explore how they behave. But I think we would like to get more physically realistic um, in the future. Um, and this does suppose that space time has some sort of non-commutative structure to it, um, which is not entirely fanciful. And so there's a, a project to explore the physics of that, if you like. But if it does, it gives a good explanation of the Planck scale, because the Planck scale is some sort of high energy cutoff where physics goes wrong and you can't have modes bigger than the Planck scale. But of course, in our finite models, there is a cutoff because you only have a finite number of eigenvalues. So there's, <laughs> there's a largest eigenvalue. Um, and it's fairly stable, actually. It tends to be about the same place in, in all our models. Um, and so this uh, exactly describes um, geometry with some sort of Planck scale cutoff. So I think that's actually a, a positive bonus feature. So what you can say is that the geometry appears to be sort of commutative at some low energy scales and at high energy scales, it's very non-commutative. And that's the Planck phenomenon. Um, and the critical thing in understanding these models is understanding the vacuum. Um, both in our random model models, but also in the physics, where we want to understand these funny features of D naught and why it has the way it is. And that's really understanding what the vacuum is. So that's what we're, we're particularly keen to engage in. Okay, so uh, I've, I'll stop there. I think I've said enough. And I think my 